My name is Abe Socher. I'm editor of the Jewish Review of Books. For the last tech decade, we've been publishing some of the best essays on important Jewish books and topics in the English speaking world. If you enjoy our articles and events like these, but haven't yet subscribed to the Jewish Review of Books, then I encourage you to do so. Just go to jewishreviewofbooks.com after this um, conversation and hit the subscribe button. Meanwhile, let's, uh, let's go to our conversation. This summer, um, we we're starting to feel lonely during the shutdown. So we began these monthly conversations with some of our favorite authors and thinkers. Tonight, December 24th, we'll have Professor Sarah Abravaya Stein who will be discussing her really terrific book, um, Family Papers, a Sephardic, a Sephardic Journey Through the 20th Century, which we reviewed just a couple of issues ago. By the way, I promised Sarah that the Chinese food was on me if she'd come tonight and we did order it, both of us, but we also both ultimately decided that we weren't really brave or foolhardy enough to eat it in front of you. Now let's turn to our guest. Um, Sarah Bravaya Stein holds the Viterbi Family Chair in Mediterranean Studies at, at Jewish, Mediterranean Jewish Studies at UCLA, where she also directs the program in Jewish Studies. She's the author of nine books. She's won many awards, both for her scholarship and for her teaching. Um, and she has done both in this books and for previous books, really extraordinary work in archives all over the world, um, which, uh, and, and that scholarship uh, of, of hers and, and her colleagues, but, but she really she's a leader here, um, have helped us reconceptualize Jewish life in the modern world. Um, but, and uh, this is why we wanted so much to have her here and are so excited that she is. She's also the kind of historian who is not afraid to tell a story. And she really does both things in family papers. That is um, important archival research, which reconceptualizes um, what it is to be modern in the Jewish world. And, um, and she tells a fascinating story of a remarkable, Sephardi family. Sarah, um, thanks for coming. <laughs> hey, good to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good to see you. We're in the midst of a, a snowstorm here in the Midwest. What's it like in Santa Monica? A very strange phenomena um, occurred in the skies of Santa Monica today, which was a, a form of clouding that would be unrecognizable to me were I not a native of Oregon and <laughs> followed by mysterious moisture falling from the sky. But they tell us it's rain and that, that order will be restored. So, um, so here we are, weathering the pandemic as best we can. Um, you know what? Let me begin right away with a with a question from a, a reader. Um, uh, P. K. Avery asks, uh, "How how did you discover the the Levy family, and when did you realize that you were going to devote years of your life in a book to them?" Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, well, this book came on the heels of another book, um, which was a um, the translation and publication of a memoir, which I, I uh, co-edited with my dear friend and colleague and former teacher, Erin Rodrigue, a memoir which we understood to be the first memoir written in Judeo-Spanish or Ladino. And it was translated uh, by Isaac Jerusalmi and we brought it to press. Um, and the author of that memoir was um, really a towering figure in Judeo-Spanish, Sephardic, Southeastern European culture. He was um, one of the pioneers of the creation of modern print Sephardic uh, Ladino culture. And partly because he was a, a printer and an editor of the most important uh, newspapers in Ladino and French in his native city, which was Ottoman Salonika, current day Thessaloniki. Greece. So he wrote a memoir. Um, it's an unusual memoir because it's, it's a bit of, a, of, an, of a, um, an angry memoir in a certain sense. He, he wrote to vindicate himself after um, being excommunicated by the rabbinical establishment of his city um, for reasons we can discuss <laughs> if you wish, but in short, because he used his printing press as a platform for his modern ideas. And he wrote this memoir 
Um, and the, he had a scribe write it in a, in a very inexpensive notebook, uh, the kind of notebook that a business person might use to just keep daily um, accounting. Um, and this amazing document, which told of his world, of his family, of his outlook on life, um, written over a series of decades in the mid to late 19th century, this extraordinarily extraordinary document managed to outlive um, the empire in which it was created, um, certainly his lifetime, his children's lifetime, to undertake a journey from um, Salonika to Paris, to Rio de Janeiro, to Jerusalem, um, where it was deposited in an archive and found by my, my colleague, Aaron Rodrigue. And as we were finishing this translation, I asked myself, um, how had this, this manuscript undertaken this extra, extraordinary journey and right. what had become of his descendants? And that's the question. <laughs> that was the question that took me over a decade um, to answer. And partly it had to be answered by following this notebook backward through its re remarkable modern journey, which in turn opened up um, branches of this family all across the world and, and across time. Wow. Um, well, maybe we'll begin this way. Do you, you, you really set the, um, you really set the scene of, uh, of the, uh, of the story to come so well in that, in the opening passage, would you mind just reading the opening? No, I'd, I'd be delighted. This is, um, the opening of, of the book in a chapter I call Writers. This is the story of a single Sephardic family whose roots connect them to a place and community that no longer exist. The place was the port city of Ottoman Salonika, present day Thessaloniki, Greece, one of the few cities in modern Europe ever to claim a Jewish majority. The community was made up of mostly Ladino or Judeo-Spanish speaking Jews, Sephardic families who traced their ancestry back to Sepharad, medieval Iberia, from which they were expelled in the 1490s, but who for the next five centuries called the Ottoman Empire, Southeastern Europe and Salonika home. Today, the papers of the Levy family are spread across nine countries and three continents. The single largest collection, the papers of Leon Levy, is kept by his four grandchildren in a private vault in Rio de Janeiro. It consists of nearly 5,000 handwritten and typed letters, telegrams, photographs, legal and medical documents, and miscellany, address books, expired passports, and more. By far the largest private archive I have encountered as a professional historian and near obsessive document hunter. In a suitcase in a spare garage in a retirement village outside Johannesburg, there is another repository of Levy family papers. Smaller than the Rio collection, the South African one is nonetheless of immeasurable historical value. It includes such cherished souvenirs as a silhouette cut in Salonika in 1919, capturing the likeness of a young woman about to emigrate from her native city, never to return. Other family papers have turned up in private hands in England, one collection boxed up in a home in London has survived multiple migrations from Greece to Great Britain, to Germany, to India, back to Great Britain and on to the United States. Another housed in a scenic village outside Manchester contains fragile glass slides taken in 1917 in Salonika's Jewish cemetery, then the largest Jewish cemetery in Europe. Yet more documents, photographs and objects have materialized in Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Great Britain, Greece, Hungary, Israel, Italy, Portugal, and the United States, not only family-owned papers, but documents and photographs held by 30 archives, travel documents, naturalization papers, birth, death, and medical records, letters exchanged by relatives, lovers, and friends, business papers, even a baptismal certificate. All told, these scattered sources have allowed me to trace an intimate arc of the 20th century. The Levy family papers catalog the lives and losses of multiple generations, contain papers written in eight languages and reflect correspondence among members of a single family spanning the globe. This is a Jewish story, an Ottoman story, a European story, a Mediterranean story and a diasporic story, a story of how women, men and children experienced wars, genocide and migration, the collapse of old regimes and the rise of new nations. 
The Levy papers also reveal how this family loved and quarreled, struggled and succeeded, clung to one another and watched the ties that once bound them slip from their grasp. Whew, wow. Um, well, maybe we, before we, we go to the, the ties and the loosening of ties, maybe, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about this remarkable city that they started in, Salonika. Um, is it true that it was, um, that, that the ports were really closed on Shabbat uh, during the early 19th, till the early 19th century or something like Indeed. that? Indeed, yes. I mean, this was a um, thriving Ottoman city, the third largest uh, port in the empire. Uh, and at the time that my story begins, um, which is the world of the memoirist I was describing earlier, Sadi Veselel Ashkenazi Alevi in the 19th century. And I reach back to talk about his father and mother and his grandparents. But in his world, um, Jews represent a, a, a plurality or um, mm -hmm. a majority, technically a plurality of, um, of this city which means that if one is to walk the, the port of Salonika, uh, the language one is most likely to hear at that time is Ladino. Um, this is a city made up of an internally diverse population, uh, Muslims, Christians, Jews, many more visitors, uh, merchants, consuls, um, state representatives, um, visitors. The Jewish community was internally diverse. It was a majority Sephardic, and by that specifically, I mean um, the descendants of those who came from medieval Sephardad, but it also contained Romaniote Jews, the um, Jewish Greek community that preceded the arrival of, of that population. It also included Italian Jews and um, uh, Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe. Um, and this internally diverse Jewish community was um, culturally incredibly rich. Um, and it was a community around which the city moved. So you mentioned that the port is closed on the Jewish Sabbath, um, which is a, an indication, but just one indication among many of how important Jews were to the temporal and spatial um, and linguistic and culinary fabric of this dynamic city. Um, and that place that Jews occupy changes um, dramatically over the course of the century arc that I paint in family papers. Um, and uh, as the community and as the family weathers all kinds of political transformations and demographic transformations, and as they emigrate in many directions, what is also happening is this Jewish community is, is fundamentally changing well before um, the um, tragedy of the Holocaust really decimates the community. Right, and just a trivial question, uh, Saadi Bitsalel. Ashkenazi Levi, um, Sephardi family, why is his name Ashkenazi? Well, Ashkenazi is actually a fairly common Sephardic name. And sometimes, which is true for, for in, in many cases, this is true for this man, um, it denoted descent from an Ashkenazi um, ancestor. And this is really interesting, in fact, because one of the things it shows us is that Sephardic culture, like all Jewish cultures, was never internally homogenous. It was never strictly defined by blood. Um, these were porous communities, just as Jewish and non-Jewish communities, especially as the modern period wound forward, um, were porous communities. And so his family mixed elements of Sephardic heritage, of Ashkenazi heritage, of Italian Jewish heritage, even though they would come to be these towering pillars of uh, Judeo-Spanish Sephardic culture. So this world of Ottoman Jewry, of Sephardic Jewry, of Salonican Jewry, and also of the Levy family represented um, a fascinating composite and complex alchemy of Jewish histories. And uh, before we get back to the family, one more question. Can you say a little bit about Ladino that you mentioned yeah. they that that's the language that would be spoken on the street and so on. But what is that language? Well, Ladino is um, the mother tongue of this community and of um, the Sephardic 
Spanish Jewish descended um, communities of Southeastern Europe. Some um, Jews of other backgrounds actually so-called Judeo-Hispanicized took on the language. Even some non-Jews learned the language in places like Salonika where right. it, was, it was a language of commerce. But linguistically speaking, this is a language um, based in medieval Castilian, uh, written in a Hebraic script um, that whose linguistic basis reflects the migratory history of the Jewish community itself. Um, there, it, a version of, of a Judeo-Spanish is spoken in northern Morocco in the region of Tetuan, that's Hakatiya, but I'm referring to the Judeo-Spanish specifically to the Ladino of the community um, of Ottoman Southeastern Europe and its kind of diasporic reach. Um, it, uh, it has a unique written cursive known as Solitreo and some of the family documents are in, in Solitreo as was mm. the memoir of Sadi Betelela Levi. Um, and it was uh, printed in Rashi script. Um, but the, the family has, as does Sephardic Jewry in general, a really interesting and complicated linguistic history that we can see buried um, in their letters that you know, we might want to talk about later because, of course, they changed with time. Right. And, and um, it, well, now back to that dictated memoir that, that started the whole thing. And he writes it, you said, in anger, uh, Saadi does. Um, over excommunication. So why was he excommunicated and how did that? Well, so, yeah, so Saadi, um, as he, he was known by his first name, Saadi by uh, contemporaries. He inherited a printing press from his father who had inherited it from his father. And he um, in turn would operate this press uh, with the assistance of a number of his children, his sons. Um, and the press was used to publish newspapers, as I mentioned before, in French and in Ladino, but also to publish all kinds of um, miscellany, wedding invitations, uh, religious books, um, uh, Ladino language interpretations of, of, of uh, the religious canon, and much more. Um, and the family had uh, its own political orientation, which of course shifted over time, but what I'll, what I'll say for the sake of simplicity is that Saadi and his children were modernizers. Mm -hmm. And um, this will to modernize manifested in many forms, including um, sending daughters and sons to uh, a French language uh, school of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which was a, a French Jewish philanthropic educational organization. Um, but it also included supporting various political platforms that um, sometimes rub the rabbinical establishment the wrong way. And I should say that one of the really interesting things about this man, Saadi, is that he was also a musical prodigy. Um, he studied music with Jewish and non-Jewish masters, and he performed with non-Jewish and, non um, and Jewish masters a particular Ottoman musical tradition. And he also composed music. And, some of the music that he composed uh, was so daringly modern as to employ instruments that the rabbinical establishment considered um, treif, such as um, the violin, or to use a Turkish melody to apply it to a religious prayer, a mm. Jewish religious prayer. These are all examples of ways in which he was um, a thorn in the side of the rabbinical establishment. It did not help that he also used his printing press to accuse the rabbinical leadership of uh, mal financial mal malfeasance, which uh, certainly did not find favor in their eyes. And for these accumulated reasons, he was excommunicated. The writ of harem was applied to him. He was excommunicated. And it was really a personal trauma for him because he was an observant man. He considered himself uh, religiously observant. It was also applied to one of his sons. And in a very dramatic act that he describes in his mem memoir, they are literally driven through the streets of, of his city, Salonika, on foot, pursued by rabbinical henchmen and a mob that gathers to, to watch the excitement unfold. Um, and he really never recovers from this trauma, um, which also imposed financial consequences because it meant that he could not do com theoretically do commerce with other Jews as, as well as uh, um, participate in a minion with, with uh, the Jewish community. So it is 
largely out of a desire to vindicate his name that he writes the memoir. Um, and that's why I say it has an angry streak to it. There, there are traces of nostalgia, mm. but nostalgia isn't really the driving factor. It's, it's really a sense of wanting to reclaim his reputation and, um, and out of a sense of justice. And that passion um, and that sense of being misjudged is actually a quality that I see um, th that passes through the family, uh -huh. through the generations. You know, you might look for more obvious things passing through the generations, mm -hmm. physical characteristics, or but there's also this personality streak, a stubbornness, um, a sense of being wronged, a sense of, of moral rightness, um, and sometimes peak itself, which I can kind of trace um, through the generations, arguably up, up to the present day. Um, bef before um, I follow up on that, um, uh, Leanne Netzer asks an interesting question. W why wasn't the violin allowed? What, what did the <laughs> rabbis have against violins? Um, you know, I think that some of the um, irritants that troubled the rabbinical leadership at this time were symbolic. They weren't necessarily um, strictly questions of, of the breaking of law or the threatened breaking of law. The idea was, um, I think, um, a, a fear of new forms of authority, whether it was cultural or, um, or, or embodied new forms of authority that threatened the power of the rabbinical establishment. And I wanna say that what's really important is that this wasn't a struggle between a static religious leadership and a modern firebrand at all, because the religious leadership was undergoing dramatic evolution at this time. And indeed the fact that they used the writ of harem was uh, evidence that they were struggling to adjust to the changing times and to uh, recalibrate their leadership and their and their power and and how they employed it. So, in not so much in family papers, but in in the translation of the memoir, um, which was published under the title "A Jewish Voice from Ottoman Salonika," in that translation, um, Aaron Rodriguez and I really engaged this question of of a struggle. Um, over modernity uh, in 19th century Ottoman Salonika. Right, we actually published a piece of that. You did. Remember with you. I remember yeah. that. Um, uh, why, if he's a, he has this printing pre press in his house, but he, he never considered publishing the memoir. It was a, was it just a Yeah, that's an interesting document? question. I, you know, it's, it, was a private document, but he wrote in a preface that he wished that it would be shared. Hmm. And over many decades, his sons who carried on the family printing press published snippets of the memoir that they um, took from the original Solitreo form and, and um, transcribed and sometimes edited and condensed and published paragraphs of it here and there. And it's precisely because they did that, that historians knew the memoir existed. Um, why didn't he publish the memoir in full? Um, or why didn't his sons publish the memoir in full? I think that perhaps it was their intention to publish it in serialized form, but it was sort of unfolding gradually and never came to fruition. But it was a rather poignant, um, aspect of, of finally publishing it in English that we felt that we were honoring his his wishes for this document. So um, let's jump to the to the next to the next generation, the generation of his children. And he has a lot of children, right? Yes, he does. He has 11 children. Um, and um, and it's that transition, I take it, um, where one begins to see this is not merely the story of one family, but um, but is a kind of um, uh, historical process writ small within in in the in the life of of this family, a, a, a kind of micro history or something. Um, so what happens with his children? Tell us about a couple of them. 
Yeah, it's it's extraordinary. I I um, draw a comparison here, which maybe some historians would find objectionable, but between the fates of his children and the fates of the fictional children of Sholem Aleichem, um, who walk the various byways of modernity that the world offered East European Jews. Well, here we have a strangely evocative story. We have children who walk various of the byways that modernity offered Ottoman Jewry. So I'll give you an exa some examples, just a few. Yeah. Yeah. Um, among his daughters, one will become a teacher in the Alliance Israelite Universelle. And as I mentioned before, this is a French Jewish philanthropic organization that opened schools across North Africa and the Middle East and Mediterranean for Jewish youth who they felt um, needed an education in um, secular subjects uh, in the French language as a way to elevate themselves um, culturally and economically. She was a, a graduate of the school in Salonika and she went to Paris to be trained as a teacher and then she is placed uh, first alone and eventually with her husband, who's also a teacher, in an amazing array of places across North Africa and the Middle East. And she has a whole career as a, a professional uh, living, it must be said, a really hard scrabble life with her husband because this organization did not pay its teachers very well. But she is a woman who- Some things never change. <laughs> Touche, some things never change. But she is a woman who travels far from home and- is a breadwinner. Um, so that is Rachel. Um, one son, um, Sam uh, Levy, who um, is born Shmuel Sadi Levy, becomes Sam Levy, follows his father really into the publishing industry and keeps publishing through the course of his entire life, keeps publishing newspapers, which like his father, he uses as a platform to voice his strident political opinions, sometimes um, very quirky ones. Um, and he will, throughout his career, until he, he will still be publishing um, all the way to the 1960s. Um, What's a quirky the other... one? What's, what's one of his quirky? <laughs> well, I mean, for, you know, he was both quirky and incredibly profound. Um, an example of the quirkiness is that he published a kind of phantasmagorical commercial guide to the Mediterranean, which he called um, the Sam's Guide, um, which I think was largely a way to accrue capital by selling advertisements to his friends and family spread out across. Um, but it, it was it gave you gave one articles about how to engage in commerce and, and really culture and travel through the Mediterranean. Um, and I want to mention one other, his brother, one other son who, um, like his siblings, was trained in the in the Allianz schools get some legal training early on, uh, acquires a job for the Ottoman administration in Salonika, representing the Ottoman Passport Bureau. His name is first um, David Alevi, and he receives ultimately a Turkified name with an honorific, Daoud Effendi, mm -hmm. because he becomes, after serving the passport office for the Ottoman Empire, he becomes the chancellor of the Jewish community of Salonika, which he, a position he will hold through the inner, much of the interwar period. Um, and he commands incredible authority in this community. Um, and Daoud Effendi, along with one other sibling, will perish in Auschwitz, which shows you what a remarkable and condensed historical voyage this family takes. So he was once a servant of the Ottoman regime as a, as a passport official and will we'll perish in the death camps of the Nazi regime. Other children take other paths, but I think it just gives you a taste of how for the women and for the men, um, they took roots that were um, both typical and exceptional of their day. And I, and I didn't mention migration and Sam was one who left. He went, he went to Paris where he lived out his life. And that too, along with a westernized education, along with investment in the um, Greek state when it was eventually created, um, along with politics and, and a belief in Jewish culture was fundamental to this generation of, of Sephardic youth. And um, so 
you've mentioned half a dozen family members by now, and there's probably, I mean, there are chapters on perhaps two dozen uh, and others along the way with stories intertwined. How did you keep it all straight? Did you have <laughs> like a map on legend on the I, that's a good or... question. I did. I used um, a family tree software actually. That at uh, one point, when I printed printed it, it stretched twelve pages horizontally <laughs> just to keep all of the family. But it's you know um, this story. We all know what family documents are like. I mean, we met most of us have bits and pieces of them. And for a historian, it is um, no easier or harder really than for anyone else to string these stories together and to understand who the people were and what their, what their paths were and how they, um, how they moved and how they lived. And, and I think even more profoundly to try as, as I did, to try to inhabit their spirit in some way takes um, enormously painstaking work. And also um, I think an element of um, non-empirical um, empathetic labor to really read them, uh, you know, not just for the facts that their stories tell um, about a wider world, but to try to, to read the person through what can sometimes be very um, um, unforgiving sources, like medical records, let's say, for example. Um, that was that was part of the challenge. And I made the choice um, to organize the book chapter by chapter with each chapter representing a person. Right. And we follow some people through the course of their lives and a few people for idiosyncratic reasons command only one chapter. Um, and for me, this was a choice to move from a macro history, as you said, a, you said a, a micro history, but I would say even more, it was the choice to move from a macro scale to an intimate scale mm. and to really think of it as a history. It's a world history, but it's a world history told through individual people's lives. And, and that was really my goal was to let the people um, loom larger than the um, political timeline. And it was also a way to have women's histories um, speak louder than they sometimes do in, in other historical works. And are, are the women as, as well represented in the archival documents as, as the men? Well, uh, Rachel, who I mentioned a moment ago, the teacher who serves right. Alliance Israelite Universelle, she and her husband command a, a, a huge ar archival collection, which is in the Alliance archives in Paris. Um, they generated many, many, many professional letters, although fewer personal ones. Um, but I, what I had to realize, Abe, and it, it actually took me quite a while to wrap my mind around this, is that I had to respect um, the importance of archival collections that appeared more humble. So certain men who were men of letters, Saadi himself, his son Sam, his son Daoud Effendi, um, a, a grandson, Leon, the one in Rio, who, who loved to write. And Leon not only wrote prolifically over the course of his life, but saved the letters he himself sent, saved copies. Mm -hmm. So he had a, um, a, a, a steadfast passion for the written word. I really had to work against those voices in a sense to find histories of women that could easily be ignored um, that became manifest, not so much, except for Rachel, not so much in prodigious collections of documents, but in um, quieter moments of um, material history, let's say, or of um, the communication of, of blessings, um, of prayers, of, of love, the sending of objects, of um, amulets, of jellies. Um, I mentioned as I read the opening to the book, the young woman who has a silhouette cut in likeness of her face. These were, were the traces of women in the family um, and fashion is another because fashion was an abiding um, thread of this family's history right. that women as well as men were engaged in, but especially the women. So to follow those documents, let's call them documents broadly, to follow those historical objects took, um, 
it, it took determination and a, and a reorientation from what historians often think of as sacred, which is the written word, to a much more um, diverse body of, of sources. And so while you're following these threads and you're in Paris in the archive and you're in Rio and you're in Israel, and um, are you also talking to the descendants at the same yeah, time? Yeah, speaking with the descendants was absolutely instrumental to this process. First of all, um, because they hold the materials. Um, and this has to do with a longer history of documents of the Sephardic past being less rigorously collected by archives and museums than documents of the Ashkenazi past. So much more, I would say, is in private hands for this piece of the Jewish world than other pieces of the Jewish world. Um, so my relationship with the living members of this family was, was pivotal because they were my gateway to their history. But it wasn't only that they had materials that proved important to me. It was also that through them, I could, through them, through their memories, um, through the objects they inherited, I was able to um, have a much more human sense of, of the family and what it had come to be. And I developed really quite close relationships with branches of the family across the world. Um, was very grateful to them. And I think the book has been quite a profound uh, contribution to the family and to how they understand uh, each other. And, and if um, you were talking, comparing it to Tevye's daughters and the various mm -hmm. paths, modern options that, uh, that their, their fictional lives played out. So if we were to look at the descendants of Tevye's daughters now, you know, I would imagine, you know, some of them are, no, are not Jewish. Some of them are still very, you know, the daughter who goes with Perchik or whatever, you know, who knows what happens. Um, how, about, how about the Levy family? What are the, what Jewish options do they, or non-Jewish options or lives do they inhabit now? Um, for the most part, the family um, continues to self-identify both as Jewish and as Sephardic mm. and to feel those connections very powerfully. Uh, but this isn't true uh, for all branches of the family. There, were, there uh, are some who grew up um, having converted to Christianity. And there were some who today I think don't necessarily self-identify, maybe by, are Jewish by heritage, but don't have a sense of, of what that means. Certainly the older generation today um, who knew their grandparents who were immigrants, they feel a connection. People in their 70s, let's say, late 60s and, and mm. older, they have a connection to that old world um, that is much uh, clearer, much tighter than their children and their grandchildren or do, their great grandchildren. Do they um, speak and, Ladino? Uh, no, no. Um, there is uh, no. I think that I'm not over speaking when I say that um, none of the living members of this family, who whom I have been in touch with, um, speak Ladino or can read the Ladino. Uh, in the documents that they or their family members possess. And that um, probably ceased to be true roughly in the 1970s, that when mm -hmm. that um, generation that was Salonic and born, when that generation passed. Um, but interestingly enough, I think that for all of the changes, all of the mass migration that they underwent, um, uh, the, the the fact of having um, lost, having suffered such tragic losses in the Holocaust, uh, and being pulled apart from one another, such that at a certain point, they they seem to me to cease to be family. Mm. Um, interestingly enough, I think that the book has um, reconnected them to their past and to one another. Um, so that the history I tell uh, in, in some ways now has a life of its own, um, which I didn't anticipate um, 
when I published the book. You didn't expect to be invited to the family reunions. No, I told you, Abe, and um, those listening might be interested to hear that during the course of my research, I was always interested that the cousins didn't ask to be put in touch with each other if they didn't know each other already. And I would dangle these clues, you know, oh, I just was emailing with your cousin in Manchester, or, you know, I just visited someone in Montreal. And I expected the next question would be, can you introduce us? And I, I think it's a complicated um, dynamic such that they chose not to during my research process, but after the book was published and under pandemic conditions, um, when we are all reassessing what connection means and what family means um, and the importance of being in contact in, in this moment, they reunited and I participated with them in November in a, in a Zoom reunion of, of the family that had, um, I think it was six continents represented, which is wow. just extraordinary and four generations represented wow. on that call, many of whom had never, um, not only not met each other, but not been aware of each other before the publication of the book. I, I wanna go back, um... It, we t touched on it a little, but to the terrible um, mm. story of uh, what happened to the, the Jews remaining in Salonika dur during the Holocaust. Could you tell us about that and also about the, the Levy family in particular? Yes. Uh, well, I'm sure there are some people on the call who themselves have family from Salonika or from Southeastern Europe. Um, and they will know this history intimately. But I think there are many other um, informed readers about Holocaust and Jewish history who may not be aware of the extent of devastation of Greek Jewry and Salonican Jewry in particular in the course of the Holocaust. Um, this community suffers the highest rates of destruction of just about any uh, community in Europe. Uh, not by sheer numbers. We think of a place like Warsaw, which had so many millions of Jews who were annihilated, but by percentage, Salonika suffers destruction in 97, 98%, which as I say, is, is about the highest of any yeah. community. So they, um, Salonika and Jewry in general, and the Levy family in particular, uh, suffer astronomical losses. Um, and it isn't only those who have stayed in Salonika at the time of the occupation uh, by the SS, but there are also members of the family who have um, moved to emigre settings earlier. Uh, many of them moved um, between uh, the, the, between when um, Salonika becomes Greek during the Balkan Wars of 1911-12. They start to, to leave roughly around then, um, accelerating during the First World War. So they've been in many of them started to go to Paris. And in Paris, there are more emigre members of this family than any other single place. Um, and those people too fall prey to occupation and deportation and um, internment, and in many cases uh, to annihilation at, at the hands of, of the Nazis. So the extent of devastation is, um, uh, you know, is, is unfathomable. Um, and in Salonika, in particular, for the family who was there, most of the community members um, will be deported to Auschwitz, which was true for most of the Jews of the city. Right. Um, but there is, as you know, um, very painful and curious history of a subset of the family who, who experiences a different fate. Right. So this... Um... Actually, somebody asked, uh, more than one person asked on, uh, in the Q&A whether there was pushback from family members uh, that didn't want their story told. So there is this terrible story that you uncover about, about this family member, Vital. Um, I mean, I think many people will buy the book, um, but could you tell us a little bit about, yeah. about it? So I was shocked to discover um, I mentioned earlier that um, if we think way back to the 19th century and the, and the excommunication of Sadi B'Tselel Levi, that he was excommunicated with his son, Chaim. Mm -hmm. um, Chaim's grandson, I hope that I have the family tree right in my head, uh, or great-grandson, was um, a young man who 
emerges to serve as the head of the, the Nazi appointed head of the Jewish police in Salonika. Vital Hassan is his name. And um, he is a notorious sadist. Uh, and by reviewing uh, oral histories and testimony by survivors in many languages, um, you know, in, in Hebrew and Ladino and French and Greek and English, they tell stories of the um, extreme sadism and violence, um, including sexual violence that he meted out on members of this community. Um, he serves the head of, as head of the Jewish police um, at the near end of the war, just as the last transport of Jews is being taken to Auschwitz, he, um, he flees uh, eastward, hoping to escape the allies. He flees um, with his wife and his one-year-old daughter and his pregnant lover and um, a couple of his cronies. And there is an extraordinary, I mean, a truly unbelievable story of repeated captures and escapes um, until he is ultimately, um, after four arrests, ultimately um, held by the allies. Uh, and he and his wife will be um, imprisoned and charged by the Greek state at the behest of the Jewish community charged with complicity with the Nazis. And um, I, it's, I, to my knowledge, he is the only Jew who will be executed um, for this crime in all of Europe after the war. Um, I know the question was about those family members who didn't want the story to be told. And I have to explain that um, in all of the thousands of documents, uh, family owned documents that I looked at, never, is Vital's name mentioned explicitly. Never is his trial discussed. Um, if I had only read the papers and stopped there, I would not have known that he existed. Um, but I discovered the records of his trial uh, and the testimonies I referred to earlier. So the family was unprepared uh, for this revelation. I was totally unprepared for this revelation. I had no idea this was in the family history. Um, uh, so it wasn't that they were f fearful of this story being told because it, his history had been systematically erased from the family. He was removed from all family trees. As mm. I say, he was very carefully left out of letters. Although when I reread those same letters, I realized he was actually there all along, but in a shadowy fashion, it was a kind right. of code. Um, so I was very sensitive about um, the pain mm, that telling this story would cause the family. I was very, I, I tread extremely gingerly in, in the telling of this story because I felt as a professional historian, it was my, my duty um, to be faithful to the historical record. But as a person who had come to know this family well, I also was sensitive to want to respect um, um, the, the living members of this family, uh, uh, particularly one of whom um, is quite close to the characters involved. So it was, um, it is an ethical struggle. And it was, a, it was what I might think of as a writerly struggle that I had in, in producing family papers. And you, I think you can see it in the book. You can, you can see um, the questions I'm, I'm posing to myself and um, the ways that I am and I'm not telling this story. Was it hard? So it was hard to write. Did you dread? It was extremely, you think like, I dreaded it. I dreaded it. It was like very, I, very I'll put off to to working on this chapter, you know. It was the certainly the piece of the history that I um, labored over the most. Um, mm. Wanting to honor uh, the passion of the testimonies that told of his excesses, but also wanting to be I'm cautious to corroborate, you know, everything that I could and um, mm. knowing as readers will discover or may already have discovered that um, one of the people who opened her home to me was his daughter, that one-year-old child who was smuggled out of Salonika at war's end and knowing what a painful um, revelation and, this would be for her. And sh so she hadn't known? No. Oh. She, she had not oh. known. She, she told me that she had not known. 
Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. yeah. um, wow. Um, well, we only have a little bit of time left. It's gone. It's gone so quickly. Um, uh, Arlene Ratsabi asks, uh, is there any plan to make a, a documentary? Um, oh, I would love it. If, if, if she is a documentarian, <laughs> I would, I think that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I, I say that it's, um, it is a family history, but there's a way in which Sephardic history has lacked um, a family epic. Mm -hmm. The kind of epics that we have for Ashkenazi histories. Uh -huh. And part of why I really wanted to tell an intimate history of the family was to fill in that, that void. And it, it has this um, almost cinematic feel to it because, uh, you know, of the of the incredible arc of their history. Not, I'm, I'm not claiming credit for it myself, but to say that the, the history itself seems to, um, seems to open up such a broad landscape. Right. And, um, and Donald Altschiller asked an interesting question. Did, um, did, were the Mormon um, family archives or, or uh, family genealogies useful in, in your, I have consulted those for other projects, but for this project, they weren't of assistance to me. Um, uh, yeah. And perhaps, um, perhaps a, a last question. Um, uh, what is uh, the Jewish community of Salonika or Thessaloniki like now? And, and um, how many are there? What sort of lives do they lead? Um, well, this is a community that is um, a, really a, a, a shadow of what it once was. It is numbering in the few thousands, you know, rather than uh, the, the, the towering scale that it, of tens of thousands that it that it once was. Um, it doesn't. It, it once had dozens of synagogues in operation. Not so anymore. Um, it. Um, has opened a very beautiful museum. Um, and there's an interesting little sub story that while I was writing uh, this book, um, uh, there was a, an uncovery of tombstones across the city that had been taken from the uh, pillaged and ransacked Jewish cemetery of Salonika, which was dismantled by the Greek municipality in the course of the Second World War with the knowledge and uh, permission of, of the Nazi occupiers. And the stones were used um, to build um, streets and churches and um, sidewalks and such. Uh, and among the things one can see at the Jewish Museum is um, Saadi's tombstone, which was among those that was repurposed and then retrieved. So the community is um, from a historical perspective, a mere shadow, uh, still has um, multi-generational members, including some who I consulted for this project, um, but is like most of the erstwhile centers of Sephardic Jewry in Southeastern Europe is really um, feels, it, it has a precarity to it if one knows the broader history of this world. And it's very difficult if you visit, you really have to, um, you have to look in the shadows, as it were, if you visit Salonika to see its Jewish past, because it isn't made um, evident. It isn't made public. Right. Um, our mutual friend Devin Nahr has written a couple of pieces yes. for the Jewish Review books about the, about contemporary mm -hmm. Thessaloniki. Um, well, Sarah Abravaya Stein, thank you very much. The book comes out in paperback in a couple comes of weeks. Comes out in paperback right? in, in a couple of weeks, yes. Terrific. And Abe, thank you. It's been wonderful to be in conversation with you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, just a quick note to you all. Um, we'll be talking to Adam Kirsch, who has uh, another great new book out called The Blessing and the Curse um, about uh, 20th century or really modern Jewish literature. Um, Adam is, of course, a frequent writer for JRB and an editor at, at the Wall Street Journal and really one of our leading critics and um, that'll be January 26th and I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks everybody. Keep reading.